That's right. All right. We start in Brussels this morning where all of the leaders got together for a big photo op. It was great to watch them. President Biden, uh, Emmanuel Macron, Justin Trudeau, all of the big NATO leaders getting together to take a big photo and uh, glad hand and, and talk about what they plan to do with it's, it is like a rogues gallery. Of very like, diverse group of like here, you know, diverse and representative of the world. Yeah, very diverse. Lots of old white guys um, who get together and decide what they want to do with the rest of the world. Um, we are learning quite a bit this morning about what they plan to do, namely sanctions, more sanctions, more sanctions for Russia with nary a word, any discussion at all about like how these sanctions are reverberating around the world. Like how how are they actually hurting the United States of America? How are they actually hurting uh, African nations? No discussion about how, you know, these Ukrainian uh, sanctions against Russia, all of this could actually hurt um, uh, the global uh, global nations in the South. Like twenty six out of fifty four African states don't support this. Right. Do not support this. But guess who's going to be hit the hardest in all of this? Us. Africa. Oh. Africa. <laughs> America, well, yes, us and Africa, African nations who rely on wheat and all sorts of other exports, crushing, crushing problems for them. Meanwhile, Russia doing just fine. Seems to be, yeah. right? And so, yes, the, there's sort of a global humiliation in terms of anyone who wants to remain on Instagram or Twitter uh, or Facebook, but Russia has already been able to continue to do business. Um, it does not seem as though they are shaking in their boots about more sanctions. But the United States is now worried that the European Union will not be able to survive without Russian gas and exports because the European Union is far more dependent on Russian gas and exports than the United States. So President Biden is expected by Friday to announce a plan to take Europe off of Russian oil dependence. And the word is that they could, huh, who would have some oil to give, uh, maybe make sure that the European Union is dependent instead mm. on U.S. oil, which oh, just US doesn't oil. make sense to me, right? Because the United States is also having an oil crisis. Didn't we just fly to Saudi Arabia or like flying to Saudi Arabia to ask those uh, those warmongers and, and those human rights abusers, those who literally executed and beheaded 81 uh, individuals last week, like also, we, we want their oil, so we're going to take their oil and then redistribute it <laughs> throughout Europe. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, we are keen to take oil from Venezuela now. When the Trump administration in 2017 had put sanctions on Venezuela for being corrupt, we are now no longer concerned about that. So we could buy oil from Venezuela and provide it to Europe. Um, it's not a very efficient channel. You would think that the European Union would also be able to buy its own oil from other places that are not named Russia. But no, the United States seems keen to insert itself into this. Um, you know, you could say that's nice of them. And you could also say that's opportunistic. You get to choose what you say about it. Meanwhile, the well, United is States is like now making contingency plans. Sorry, just uh, uh, making contingency plans in case Russia decides to use its most powerful weapons. This is sort of like an underlying major theme of this. David, go ahead. But this is like the, the nuclear part of this whole thing is the big concern. Like, what if they use chemical weapons? What if they use nuclear weapons? That's the big concern this morning. Well, and you know, you remember uh, Alex Jones, how he would always follow the Bilderberg group, the Bilderberg mo meetings? Yes. It's yeah. kind of like now this is the version 2.0 that's just out in the public. They're like, well, we keep getting busted, so let's just have these in public. Like these, all these people get together and decide how our fate. Well, and that's exactly what these meetings are over the night. I mean, NATO meeting, number one, and then with no, no discussion about Africa. Right. No right. discussion about uh, these countries that don't support this. Right. So they get to drive the narrative for the world and then they get together and they have the big uh, G7 meeting and they get to decide from there what more they want to do about refugee status, nuclear well, it's weapons. A, it's arm, a meeting of colonizers. We were just talking about colonizers That's right. yesterday. Yeah. That's what this what this is. So the U.S. making these contingency plans. Let's go through this David Sanger report. I think it's interesting in case Russia uses its most powerful weapons. Uh, the White House has quietly assembled a team of national security officials to sketch out scenarios of how the United States and its allies should respond if Putin, frustrated by his lack of progress in Ukraine, um, 
decides to unleash his stockpiles of chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons. Okay, there's so many things assumed in just that opening lead that I have a problem with. First of all, it's called the Tiger United team. States. <laughs> by the way, they call they're calling themselves the Tiger Team. By the way, just so <laughs> okay, but in. let's say they have quietly assembled this team to think about the what if situations um no the united states has been doing that for at least 40 years so this is not all of a sudden what if russia goes nuclear right um okay so there's that uh to unleash stockpiles of chemical biological or nuclear weapons uh, also we're assuming that v vladimir putin feels frustrated and that he, the invasion is not going exactly as he had planned which is an assumption right so none of us know that right so we this may ac actually be his plan i mean um, if you listen to the west the west is saying like he's really upset right he's now he's losing he's firing his own he's firing his own staff we can't he can't find his defense minister like he went missing overnight apparently Apparently, you know, who who knows what's actual truth coming out of the Western media coverage of him? Ukraine is winning. Russia is losing. I don't. Have you seen Maripol? Have you seen some of these cities right now? I mean, who who's winning in this war? I mean, millions well, and, of Ukrainians are <laughs> fleeing. Who's winning? No, it and does not at all they, seem clear or a foregone conclusion. Unfortunately, they took off RT News, too, where we were actually able to hear you know, Putin and, and uh, other people speak from both sides. Well, it, maybe it's propaganda still, but you were able to hear another side of the narrative. And that other side of the narrative continually gets pushed, you know, hidden from us. Yeah, of course, because again, propaganda, right? I tweeted a story the other day about the CDC and it had, it, it came from RT News. It was a story about how the United States CDC was revising its death records as it relates to COVID. This is all verifiable. All you need to do is go to the CDC's website and confirm the numbers. And yet Twitter blocked it and said it was state affiliated media and people who didn't even, you can still click on it and read the story. But so many people on Twitter were like, Clayton, you're better than this. You're, 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 you're tweeting Russian propaganda. Like it's a story about America's CDC, which is verifiable on the CDC's website. Just because Twitter decides that they want to put this little, you know, blurb up there, it doesn't discount the journalism behind it. Right. So I don't know. It's, it, I find it, you know, that's ridiculous. Yeah. It well, it nuts. will be interesting to see if there is some sort of coordinated response between the United States and the European Union, because up until now, that was not clear, right? It did seem like there were factions that did not want this war inside the European Union. But if they can all sort of pose together and put a press release, then it does seem like these Western powers are united, or at least in this one moment, right? So, yeah. so we take the picture, they all stand there, and then they can continue to use this picture to say, oh no, we're, we're, we're united in this, right? When right. of course, this lack of uh, supply chain is going to hurt these countries um, in a not equal way. So the G7 planning to warn Moscow on this meeting, which is just starting a few minutes ago after the NATO meeting wrapped up, uh, they're going to demand that Moscow just, you know, make sure you do not use chemical or nuclear material. And that is the focus. No mention of the fact that, hey, wait a second, what about these, these laboratories that are inside of Ukraine that the United States has bankrolled for years where there are, actually are pathogens which are disturbing, particularly anthrax, um, among other things. What, any question about that at all? No discussion about that. And then also, what about all of America's nuclear weapons that are actually in Europe? Many of you might not have even known that America has umpteen nuclear weapons in NATO countries already. So again, we don't have to, in, on the United States soil, even worry about this, right? As Adam, I want to play this again because Adam Schiff, this is important to remember. The United States aids Ukraine and her people so that we can fight Russia over there and we don't have to fight Russia here. Exactly. So why is NATO going to address the fact that there are six secret locations of U.S. nuclear weapons in Europe? It was, abs it was accidentally revealed, but we know that all across Europe we have nuclear weapons in that region. So again, do unto others, right? We, the United States, we absolutely don't want them to do anything. But we are allowed to have our nuclear weapons in, in that part of the world aimed right at your country. We are able to do as much as we want in these NATO paramilitary assembly uh, driving um, you know, right towards your country. 
encroaching on your country. But we're going to send you a warning and we're going to issue a whole new round of sanctions, up to 26 new sanctions coming from member countries in NATO this morning uh, as uh, as that country continues to. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know if it's being hurt right now. We're hearing from um, some of the members of the the Russian uh, oligarchy who said these things aren't doing anything to us. These yes. sanctions aren't doing anything to us. One of the socialite daughters of one of the Russian uh, Russian uh, leaders uh, came out and it said... It was an oligarch's daughter. Yeah. I mean, but that's hardly a representative spokesperson, right? So, okay, maybe. Maybe McDonald's continues to pay employees while it shuts down restaurants. But what about the suppliers and the farmers that supply those local restaurants, right? So maybe she's doing just fine, but surely there are people who are hurt by this in small measure um, that just don't actually make it into Reuters. I was going to say somebody, somebody in the, the comments is saying like um, RT was exactly like Fox News. And that is so untrue. Like I saw more actual journalism on RT than I've ever seen on m any of the, the major U.S. networks since the Ted Koppel days. You know, the, well, those kind these of are highly days. subjective opinions, right? So, I mean, I have my own opinions about Fox News, but there is some journalism that goes on behind even the most partisan outlets. Um, yeah, so I agree. it's it's sort of hard to say you you absolutely can uh, find a bent to any one. But for instance, the CDC article that Clayton is speaking of, um, that's just sort of verifiable facts for all of us. But when we decide to like just block them out because we don't like the, the name, um, we're missing a big piece of the puzzle. And I feel like that's, you know, these Western leaders in this moment are making it seem as, the, as if these world conflicts are existing in a vacuum. Like we can transition Europe off of Russian oil and we can transition the United States off of Russian oil and it'll only affect the West, and this is the only way we care about it. And then also Ukrainian refugees are coming, you know, from all over. And so we can fast track them into certain refugee programs. And they're just going to sort of hop to the front of the line. Whereas people from Ethiopia, Syria, Yemen have been waiting for years for even just an appointment with a refugee um, immigration specialist. And they just don't get it, right? And yeah. so, like, these things absolutely have the butterfly effect, where if a butterfly flaps its wings, the effect is felt miles and hundreds of thousands of miles away. That's happening. Yeah, let's talk about this refugee crisis, right? So millions, of course, have fled Ukraine heading into Poland. Poland, according to reports I'm reading over the night, uh, a lot of these Polish neighborhoods are just overrun. They don't have space for it, right? So there's been a lot of questions like, why isn't the United States stepping up here in Ukraine and allowing refugees? After all, we've been we're pumping more money into that area than anyone else in the world you know in this proxy war and we really if we really care about the citizens right that's the thing right we're supposed to be we really care about democracy we really care about the citizens then america should be opening up its doors and shores and transports and getting these individuals out according to bloomberg this morning president biden said to announce either during the g7 or at some point today he hasn't made this announcement just yet but this is according to bloomberg that the Biden administration is going to open it up to 100,000 refugees from Ukraine. 100,000. So much so that there's going to be transports available, et cetera, so that they can get them to the United States of America. 100,000. Now, regardless of how you feel about America's infrastructure being able to handle that, that is what's going to happen, right? I couldn't help when I heard this number, though, think of like the massive bowl of hypocrisy about all of these other conflicts. You just mentioned Syria, we talk about Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan. So I dug into the numbers this morning because I wanted to see, okay, 100,000, like that's a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? So let's just go through the numbers here and look at how America has been accepting refugees. Now remember the wars that we are in, again, Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan for 20 years. I mean, the list goes on. Kuwait, we could talk about Ethiopia. Where else is America in a proxy war causing death and destruction among, among its civilians and propping up other countries? Or I don't think it even matters what our direct involvement is because we pretend we are not directly involved between Ukraine and Russia, right? But look at these numbers here on your screen. Yes, exactly. But here it's on the decline. <laughs> massively declining the amount of people that we're taking in the United States. If you look at all the way back from 1990, 125,000, it goes up in 1992. 
to like 120, 130,000, all the way down now, plummeting down to below, like below about 14 or so thousand right now. Just to give you some perspective on Syrian, Syrian refugees, right? 2016 was the height of the Syrian uh, refugees that we took in the United States. This year, or last year, 2021, 414. Wait, is it thousand? No, no, total, 100, 400 people. 400 people. That's like people. one junior high. Yeah, that's who we take in here in the United States. And you look at the numbers here, just diving even further. Since the Syrian civil war began in 2011, more than 4 million Syrians have fled the country, creating the greatest refugee crisis since World War II. Most of them have fled to Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, but many have risked death to reach Europe and possibility of a better life. Unlike Europe and Syria's neighbors, the United States has had the advantage of picking and choosing from afar, taking in just over 2,000 Syrian refugees since the war started. So then the, the super uncomfortable question, you guys, is why do some people whose conflict is new get to the front of the line? Why, right? And do, do you feel- Because they look like us. Maybe, yeah. uh, you know, it's just, uh, there's a great book that I read uh, towards the end of last year called The Beekeeper of Aleppo, which talks about a Syrian refugee family and all of the ways that they had to go to these different camps, which were really dangerous. Most of the women are um, the R word there. Mm -hmm. Children are kidnapped into slavery. Um, it's so dangerous. They, they get in boats and they sink. It's awful, right? Just to get out of a country where they know they will be hunted by terrorists and killed and bombed and what have you, their children, you know, may or may not live the journey. And then once they get to the Western nation that they've chosen, they're in a long line to provide documents. Not all of them have them. Um, and then they have a, an arduous burden of proof to prove that they actually had to flee their country, that they are in danger. Um, it's awful, right? So Again, it's just, it's not, it's one of those things where you can applaud it because you feel like, oh, good, they're suffering. That's great, right? But then you have to think about all the people who have been suffering for a long time that are brown that are then moved back to a really long line. Right. Oh, well, just look, here's one example, right? I love, this is an amazing story. Afghan refugees, right? Here, here we destroyed their country for 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. 20 years, right? U.S. Special Immigration Program refers more than 5,000 Afghan refugees to Canada. Like, we can't even, the U.S. State Department has referred more than 5,000 refugees who were seeking admission to the United States in a parallel program. Now they're moving them to Canada. They're like, the United States is like, look, we get to fight our wars over there. We don't want your people. If you want to send us brown people, we're not going to take them. Hey, white well, people from, from Ukraine? Come on over now. 100,000 of you. We'll even provide ships for you. We're going to and provide to transports. Fair, what we're doing right now in Afghanistan is worse than what we did for 20 years to the people. Yeah. Like they're suffering more now than they did then. Yeah. By many now, accounts. Now right. we've taken your money, right? Now we've seized your bank accounts. Uh, we're not letting you into our country at all. Uh, you have no heating. You have no anything in that country anymore. We just up and left and basically left all of our armament to the Taliban which makes them one of the largest armies in the world now because we just gave them all of our military equipment. Yes. So, so you know, good good luck on you guys. Good luck on you guys. I mean, these numbers though are astonishing, right? I mean, the 20, it, I mean, look at these numbers, just awfully low number of refugee admissions from the fiscal year 1990 so then to the year 2020. So then 100,000 Ukrainian refugees would be, well, let's see, what is that number last year? 11,000. Okay, so that's... 10 times more than we did last last year. We're just, we have the infrastructure for it, right? So, um, but there's bipartisan support for it, even from Republicans who hate immigration, don't want anybody coming across to like take our resources, right? That's the party line. Oh, if you're a white guy. And they're like, no, fine. Yeah, yeah if you're a Republican, on. you hate Mexicans, right? You hate, you absolutely don't want anybody coming up from Latin America. If you're from Honduras, go back. Right. If you're from Ukraine, well, come on over. Come on totally over. Totally fine. Yeah, totally fine. If you like this content, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Also, we have a membership program for the price of a cup of coffee once a month. You can support independent journalism just by going to morninginvest.com slash join. You get access to exclusive videos, plus the ability to join and chat with us live. We really appreciate your subscription and you are supporting independent journalism.